That's a chunk of walnut. We've already worked on it a little bit. We did some planer work, we did some bandsaw work, and it's getting to be on about time to start turning this thing into a gun. We talked about this gargantuan lock in a previous uh, Gersparka making machine. We've got a gargantuan barrel here, and I mean, this thing just keeps on going. It's probably out of camera angle by now. This is a pretty big barrel, but before we can mount the barrel and the lock, lock, stock, and barrel, there's a lot of work that's got to happen just to get this piece of wood ready to even start drawing on it. Let's go take a look at what's involved in planing this thing and truing it up and getting it ready for some dimensions. Before you could do anything with a stock blank, you have to establish profile and plan. We've got to get this top flat and we have to get this top 90 degrees to the side that we've run through the planer. And the reason for that is we want to be able to flip this thing on its side or on its top for it being able to run it through, in our particular case, a shaper. Because if you think I'm cutting 56 inches of barrel channel out by hand, while you watch, you got another thing coming because we don't have enough film, trust me. Anyway, the first thing we're gonna do, the top of this is not very flat. And I think even in that camera view, you, you can see that there is a lot of daylight showing underneath this. There's some high spots, some low spots. It doesn't really matter where we are. We just wanna get close. It doesn't matter if that ends a quarter of an inch high, but we gotta get it flat. Then once we get it flat, we'll roll, once we get it flat, we'll roll this whole surface, whichever way it has to go, in order to be perpendicular to this. And it's not even close right now. So we'll roll that whichever way we have to roll it. So step one's gonna be, we gotta turn this piece of lumber around because I'm right-handed and this wood grain, it's like the fur of a cat. It's running uphill like this. And you don't want to bring a plane in this way. I'm right-handed. This wants to be cut this way. It does not want to be cut this way. So even though this is the side of the stock we're going to draw on, this is the side of the stock the lock goes on, and all of our decisions are going to be made on this side of the stock, and then anything that's extra will get cut off the other side, we've got to turn it around in order to plane it, and we'll be taking our 90-degree numbers when the stock is turned around, we'll be pulling them off the back side. So I just wanted to explain why we're gonna be doing it that way, because I'm right-handed. This is one of those cases where being a lefty might have been an advantage. We're gonna use this bubble level. And I've got um, this inletting black all the way down it. Well, I can tell you right now, I know the front and the back of this thing are kind of messed up. So all I'm doing now is I'm getting a black mark on this and there's a very big black mark down here that you can't see in the overhead camera and there's another one down there and there's nothing but air in between. So we want that to mostly touch down and to take any trouble uh, planing anything other than the ends until it touches down doesn't bias anything. Still using a nice long plane. I'm just knocking wood off the end here. We got it. Oh, yeah, I took that right out. Same deal down here. Now, down here, I can't really plane it because I'm coming onto the grain. So I'm just using a very aggressive Japanese woodworking tool. Um, and we'll see where we're getting here. You got to start with an accurate layout. If you don't start this with an accurate layout, you're just wasting your time. Oh yeah, we're gonna take a lot off the front end of this. We're gonna take a lot off of that. All right. Okay, as this is coming down, the cut is moving further and further this way. And the cut won't be down to the middle here till we're a long way in. And you can see that if we just mark this wood down a little bit, we could be doing this back here. 
But all we're doing by cutting here is increasing the bow in the surface. It's just making the bow worse. And we really don't want to do that. We rub this and you can see that it left this black smudge here. This is end check. The whole, this is the raw end of the board down here. I anticipate losing about an inch of the end of this blank, but we'll make that decision later. Now's not the time, we just keep going. Yeah, and our touch point has moved up almost six inches at the back, and it's beginning to disappear. You can hear it bite here, skip here, and bite here. Make sure you relax your pressure on the backstroke. You want to press down and almost lift up, but don't lift it clear. Yeah, it's tightening right up. That gap was a full three-eighths of an inch when we began. There's some natural color in the wood down here on the end. So I've got just a cheap red lipstick and I'm switching colors. I'm switching over to a red here to see if we can't get it to show up a little bit better. Well, reddish black, whichever. So we'll go ahead and get a little rub down. This end piece here is kind of kicking my butt. I had my apprentice, Josh, running this saw running this um, plane for a little while while I took a break because I'm running this plane kind of high up in the air. My benches are not set up to do traditional woodworking. My benches are set up so that the work's up here. The problem is if you're trying to run a plane up here, it's, it's a bit of a half, not an excuse, but oh yeah, that showed up a lot better. So we'll just knock this off. And then the other thing I'm noticing is that this surface is beginning to lean this way. And the reason why it's beginning to lean this way is because it's easier to cut out here than it is in here. And what it's doing is it's leaving a little bit of air right there. You see that rock? So while we're knocking this down now, we're going to go take that inboard edge off. And I think we're going to be okay. Does it matter if this whole top surface is perfectly flat? No. All this is is a guide when we, run the, um, when we run the shaper down the side of it in order to cut the barrel channels. So we need to get close. But when we inlet the barrel, any inequalities in this will go away and we're gonna cut the top half of this off anyway. All right, so a little more down there. And then we got a mark. Right here is a big dark mark right here. Let's knock that off. Hey, if you guys see a flicker in the camera every now and then, that's because um, metal forming guy next door is running this epic, epic heliarc welder. And when he draws current, my other eyebrow starts to turn white. You can hear it now, it's cutting down almost the whole entire length. And that's what we're looking for. Oh yeah, 
See, that ain't rocking at all. That space is almost entirely gone underneath it. Now, we've gone from that really nasty looking piece of timber to something that's damn near flat. And it's touching here, 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 and here. So we're just about down. Check our level. Oh yeah, that's coming on the money. Oh yeah. Yep, a little bit more off the outboard edge and we're good. So now we're gonna concentrate on, the, on this side of the board. at it again yeah just about now as we're playing in this internal stresses are coming off a piece of lumber this big and this thing like that so we're going to get to a point in this build where we're never going to be able to take the barrel back out of this again in this humidity this whole thing could be done with a smaller plane um, but you'd have to work just the local high spots because the shorter the plane, the more it'll ride. You don't have to own one of these gigantic old beautiful planes. This thing came in here, we conserved it like it was a gun. It's a target of opportunity. I mean, it took me 40 years to find this and it found me. There's something to be said for getting swatted in the nose with stuff. So we've got a nice sharp edge here now at the top is absolutely perpendicular to the side. So we have the profile and the plan set at 90 degrees to each other. So we can flip this thing over and we will work the rest of this project in plan and profile until the last possible moment when we take this thing off squares. And that's a different thing for another day. This stock is enormous. There is a lot of extra wood here that doesn't have to be here, but how do we know where the butt plate's going to be. How do we know where anything's going to be? All right. We've got to have a completely different train of thought when you're thinking about a muzzle loader. All right. The heart of a muzzle loader is the barrel. That's the heart of the muzzle loader. The stock is merely an armature that holds all of the other things in alignment where they're supposed to be. So once we get the barrel in, the barrel determines where the lock's going to go. The lock tail determines where the trigger is going to go and the trigger determines where the heck the butt plate is going to go. The rear end of the stock determines where the rear sight is going to go, which determines where the center of balance is going to be, which determines where the end of the ramrod pipe is going to be and on out the front end of the gun. So when it all comes down to that, you've got to know where we want to set this barrel. normal human being needs a gun that's about 14 inches long so the way this stock is cut we're going to need the trigger to be right around here somewhere that's where we're going to need the trigger to be all right now i know i said this goes that way but at the end of the day i don't have limitless amounts of wood so we're going to see what we got the reason that's going to become an issue is because the sear tail on this lock is so far to the rear. If the trigger blade is going to be there, that's about where we're going to trip the lock at, right there. So that's going to put the center line of the pan right about here. Right? And if the pan's there, then the touch hole's got to be right there. That's going to be the vent. And we got to plan all this out in advance, okay? So we know for instance, that this barrel, uh, I'm going to say about an inch and a quarter. Yeah, this barrel's an inch and a quarter. So if we were to come down inch and a quarter, this is where the bottom of the barrel's going to wind up being right here. So we could inch and a quarter our way all the way down this stock. And I'm off camera now, just throwing another one out there. Yeah, that works. I'll loan those ankles to someone else. Who needs them? Is 
Now this is just a rough guess, but I'm I'm laying this uh, I'm laying this on here, and I'm just gonna hack a line in. Hang on a minute. There we go. This is an awfully large, long plank. Do me a favor and support that down there for me, will you? Just support it like right there. Just pin it. Thank you. Down a little bit. Outstanding, right? Down a little bit. Because this is a very fat marker, so you've got to be well below your line. So what I've just done now is I've scribed a line down the end of this thing. That's going to tell me where the bottom of the barrel is going to be. Now that's the bottom of an inch and a quarter barrel. Is it going to be an inch and a quarter all the way out here? No, because the barrel tapers. But for planning purposes, it's nice to know where everything's going to go. It also means that our fixed breech, we're going to re-breech this gun. But we know then that we're going to put the breech right there. And that the breech right there gives us what we want. So let's double check here. Here we go. Pans there, sear tails there. Okay. So the breech, basically the breech plug, is going to be slightly behind that by about the distance of the fence. So there's our standing breech right there. So it helps to plan all this out in advance. Because we know then that this is going to be the top of the barrel, let's see if we've even got enough stock left over. So what's really what's drop at the what's drop at the wrist? Let me get rid of that. Me standing in front of the camera. The distance from the center line of your eyeball to the bottom of your cheekbone is about an inch and a half. It is for me. This is my gun. Therefore, I'm building it for me. So if the trigger is here, somewhere back here, we got to be about an inch and a half below. And this is going to be our fantail right here. We're going to start like that. And it's going to come up like that and then roll out over the top onto the breech plug. And then we'll cut the thumb groove right there. So that's what we've got so far, so that we know my face is gonna be right here, and we want my face an inch and a half below the, the line. Everything that happens back here on a modern rifle, it fades off, but on this particular rifle, it faded up. Now, what if I didn't have enough wood up here? This blank was cut out of a, a, out of a block of wood with the grain running this way, so there's this downward leg on it. If I didn't have enough up here, and I might not, we may take this thing, put it back on a bandsaw, and cut this entire line down like that. We might do that. I don't know yet. I'm not done planning this thing. We know this has a horizontal trigger, so that's going to have to be pinned right about there. The lock will sit halfway up the barrel. So that's where we're going to meet right there. And then that's going to put the trigger right down here like this. Trigger guard's going to come out like that and go back. Once again, I'm just roughing this all in because I want to make sure that I pre-plan my way into not screwing myself. Okay, let's set that there. And that's going to put the actual sear tail right there. That'll work. This is a gargantuan lock. Gee, many Christmas, look at that. My finger is going to be under the lock. Outstanding. The rest of this then is just a matter of planning. Okay, I've got to screw the rear end of this down. So somewhere down here, there's got to be a trigger plate. There's going to have to be a bolt that goes through here in order to hold the, the tang down. We're going to have to have a, uh, we have pre-existing barrel loops on this thing. I don't want to have to go back and make all these new barrel loops. So we're going to be here, so our rear barrel loop's going to be right there. We got another one out here off camera. We got another one all the way up near the muzzle. Those are the barrel loops. So then when we drill the, the ramrod channel, we'll put the, rear, we'll put the rear end of the ramrod channel right there. 
and this stock's going to wind up coming uphill, rolling out like this, up into the ramrod channel and be done. Hey, that's too low. We want to be down here because we need to have enough room for a fairly epic ramrod, and I'm trying to reach around the camera. So you see, we've already developed an issue. We'll work all that out. So before we start cutting, we're going to know where all this is going to be and what this gun's gonna look like. Yeah, that's starting to take shape. Now, I'm working off of derivative photos. I would really love it if any of you guys happen to have a couple of good pictures of an early 1600s English uh, fantail snap hunts. Well, there it is. Make your mistakes. Make your mistakes with a pencil. All right, this has been great. We'll keep going with this later.